Welcome to Exposition, a show about uh, performers and artists in the Southeast Ohio region. And I'm Mike Thompson. I'm here with Valerie Thomas. Hi. Hi. How's it going? Pretty good. Good. And you do what when you're not here? <laughs> I really don't know. I'm, I'm trying to find myself. No, um, my daughter and I, Kelsey, and um, I have a uh, our managers at the Artisan Shop and Studio downtown, and um, it's across from the, the city park in Gal Police. And um, this time of year, we have a lot going on. Please check out our pages, the Artisan Shop and Studio page and the Gallia County Artisan Market page and our website to see what um, upcoming holiday events we have. And, and wonderful shopping experience. Um, all of the amazing things that our artisans make, um, one of a kind. Uh, please come in and visit our shop sometime. Yeah, support your local artists. Yes, they thank you it. so much. So they're not so starving. Yes, the, the starving holiday. artists, yes. <laughs> okay, so uh, we have an artist and performer here, but we're gonna look at the art artistic part our craftsmanship, Dr. Chris Kenny, who is an uh, associate professor of music here at the University of Rye Grand, and he also has his own thing at home, Acorn House Workshop, and he has a website, acornhouseworkshop.com. All one word. All one word. Right. And he uh, builds wood products, and one of those things is uh, Musical Sitting instruments. in front of us, right here. <laughs> right. Right here. So, welcome to the show, Chris. Thanks. Nice yes. to be here. Thanks for coming. Sure. We appreciate it. So, maybe you can tell a little bit about yourself, like where you're from and how this all got started. Well, I grew up in uh, Massachusetts, Fall River, and uh, started in music probably in the fourth grade. I've been around music, exposed mm -hmm. to music in the house because my dad was always playing music of some sorts and a lot of variety of sorts, jazz, classical, modern classical, down to the Beatles. Mm -hmm. And so fourth grade, they came around and said, okay, here's some instruments. Would anybody like to sign up to learn how to play them? Yeah. And so I signed up for trumpet lessons and started playing that, seemed to take to it fairly quick, fairly well. And the parents were okay with all the screeching and honking? Yeah. Well, actually, I made some sounds. Mike! Some, some okay sounds right from the beginning. That's why I couldn't go into band. They didn't <gasps> want to hear it. Oh, And man. then after two years of lessons through the school, then I went with a private teacher and, and then just built up my skills. And so when I graduated, I uh, decided that I was going to go into music. Yes. And so started at DePaul University, working in Bachelor of Music and trumpet performance and composition. I got involved with composition, finished that degree, and then went on to OSU for master's and doctorate in composition. Now, composition is not easy. You know, you think, I can write a song. All you got to do is string some notes together, but there's a whole science behind all that. Well, it's, that it, there's a science and an art. Maybe. Uh, now, grant, of course, the stuff that I was writing was more symphonies and sonatas and concertos. Uh, and one of the challenges, especially in the, well, what was then the 20th century, way back when. <laughs> back before the turn of the century. Was that music was so varied, there wasn't any one language. In the 19th century, there was one language mm -hmm. that everybody spoke. So it was the Romantic period, everybody spoke, everybody spoke the same language, no matter what part of the world you were in. 20th mm -hmm. century, everybody said, no, I want to do it this way. No, I want to do it that way. Mm -hmm. So part of the challenges of being a composer is finding your own voice. Mm -hmm. and creating things that are not sounding like anybody else. Right, that you gotta sound be unique like you. to stand out from the crowd. And so like any other art form, basically you take all the elements that you're hearing, take a little bit of that, a little bit of that, oh, I like some of that, I like some of that, pour it together, and out it comes you. And that happens the same way with woodworking. 
mm -hmm. with instrument building. Mm -hmm. You're looking at various styles, various pieces, and saying, oh, okay, I like that. I like the way the legs look on that. I like the way the top looks on that. I like this and that. And then you start to amalgamate your own style. Mm -hmm. And then it's a signature look. Yeah. It's a signature sound. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So that's so, a Chris Kenny. Mm -hmm. That's what we call it. So when did you get into building wood stuff? Well, I'd always been interested watching the PBS shows, This Old House and New Yankee Workshop, and then the DIY when that came around. Mm -hmm. You like the Woodwright shop? Woodwright shop, definitely. Yeah, he's old, old school. Definitely old school, but uh, I, I've actually met him at a couple of woodworking conferences. Oh, cool. And fun. he's not just old school just to be folksy. He's old school because he's worried about what happens when we run out of oil, when we run out of gas, when we run out of electricity. We're going to need those skills to be able to make stuff without any electricity. Right. Mm -hmm. So he's really preaching. He's not just doing it just to be folksy. Yeah. Yes. Uh, but anyway, as a student and living in apartments, never really had the opportunity to do anything until I bought my house. It had a one-car garage outbuilding in addition to the garages ta attached to the house, so I could set up a workshop there. It was wired, and I added some more wiring, got the tools, started building stuff for the house, mm -hmm. build a dining room table, just somewhat easy stuff, and then building my skills, and then eventually married those skills, woodworking skills, with music and start building instruments. Oh so what did you start goodness. with? Uh, I think the first thing was some uh, built-in cabinets for the living room. And was, that was that just uh, that sort of oak type stuff? Oak, oak plywood and putting a face on it, and yeah. but getting an oak top so it fits on a 20-foot gap. And then Oops. building a dining table out of oak and mm -hmm. some walnut. OK. Uh, I think we've got some pictures. Yep. So this first piece is one of my earliest pieces. It's got a spalted sycamore top, and so the spalting is where fungus gets in and creates all those lovely lines. Now, and is the fungus all the way through the wood, or is it just on the outside? It's all the way through. Huh. Do you have to do anything special to it's keep pretty it much, from growing? For the most part, it's all dead. You yes. do get some areas of the wood which are a little bit punky, a little bit soft. Okay. And those you can like add cyanoacrylate to harden it up. Okay. Okay. And so I put that on top of a cherry base, uh, so it's sort of arts and crafts meets uh, shaker style mm -hmm. furniture. So very simple, very basic, but Beautiful. a little bit elegant. Beautiful. And you did the little the little apple? little apple box on top with just a scrap of wood that I had. So you keep your apples in that? No, <laughs> they'd have to be well. I'd have to use crab apples. Okay. <laughs> teeny teeny teeny. And so. From that start, very derivative, good into my old, to my style, which is much more unique, uh, drawing on some of the work of George Nakashima, the Japanese American woodworker who used live edge, live, live edge slabs for his tops. Uh, I found this beautiful piece of uh, w English witch elm burl for the top, mm. but it had an odd shape. And so I had to design around the odd shape of the top rather than just cutting it into a rectangle, which would lose a lot of really gorgeous wood. Right. Mm -hmm. The edges is what makes that. The edges and just all of the burl inside of it. And burls are sort of little growths, little uh, branchlets that never emerged. Oh. And there's all sorts of patterns that. throughout that. Oh. And so put some red elm and have those <coughs> lovely leg curls. And if you notice, three are coming through, but one doesn't go through the top. So it gives it a nice asymmetrical mm -hmm. element to it. And then with a floating drawer in the middle there. So is this still in your house? It's still in my house, and it's going to stay there. <laughs> <laughs> so you can't pry, you can pry it out of your... It would cost a lot of money to buy it but from me. But you could make somebody I could make one. somebody if someone they see similar. this and they think, I need that. I could make something similar, yes. Yes. What would be the uh, cost for something like uh, that? Uh, depending upon the wood, it'd probably be around 1000 plus. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's what I kind of figured, because it's kind of... Looks like a lot of work and some odd... Yeah, uh, anytime you start working with curves in furniture, it takes a lot more time to deal with. Mm -hmm. S straight, boxy, rectangular, that's easy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Curves are hard. 
And so in addition, I've also made some smaller stuff just when you're looking for Christmas gifts and trying to think, okay, what am I gonna get Aunt Jane this year? Yeah, yeah. And so these are some salt boxes. I always like contrasting wood, so I have mm -hmm. both cherry and maple combined to give it a nice effect with a pivot so you can move the top aside, grab some salt, throw it in the pot, move the top back, and it's ready for the next one. A lot of people use salt boxes? Yeah. More and more in fine cooking. Okay. Because they're not just using table salt, of, uh, table salt out of a shaker, they're using kosher salt flakes, yeah. which work better, they attach themselves to food better, they dissolve better. Yeah, I'm sure that make my mac and cheese a lot better. They could. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and this next piece is a jewelry box that I made for a customer that I was building a guitar for and he had an anniversary coming up and so he wanted to get something for his wife and so he asked me to build a, a jewelry box in the meantime and took some of the wood that I was using for his guitar, that's the, the uh, madrone burl on top, the redwood, and some of the curly maple that was going into the neck. And the curly maple is a lighter wood. The, the lighter wood, right, with all those sort of wavy elements through it. And designed this jewelry box for him. And uh, when we open it up, we can see that it has compartment at, up at the top with lots of uh, boxes for individual pieces. Lift that out and then there's another divided compartment un underneath. And I guess that top is uh, joined in the center? The very center of that, it's actually floating. Because one of the things you always have to be aware of with wood is wood movement. Mm -hmm. And so if you look Expanding. at any door panels, you never want to glue the center of a door panel in. Mm -hmm. You want it to be able to move a little bit right. in the grooves. So that way, as the seasons change, it doesn't start cracking. Now, my shop is an unheated one. It's a one-car garage. There's no heat in it. It's got open vents, so it gets very cold in the winter. So this is seasonal work. So this is a little bit seasonal, and so one winter I decided, okay, I think I'm going to build myself a uh, amplifier, guitar amplifier. And so they have kits, or you can do it individually. So I started with a kit that came from England, built the amplifier part of it. It worked, but it needed a house. Mm -hmm. So then I drew upon the woodworking when it warmed up and built the cabinet for the amplifier. I'm sure this is tube amps, right? Tube, all tube amps. Mm -hmm. I do not do solid state. Does, I figure. Does it matter what kind of wood then you use for the amplifier as opposed for to... For the cabinet, uh, it can. Okay. You want a fairly lively wood. Now, for the amplifier head, it doesn't matter as much. For where the speaker goes into, there it is important. What, mm. would, you work, what would you use? That's why when you hear cabinets that are made of particle board, they sound dead and dull mm -hmm. because the particle board just absorbs, doesn't vibrate. Mm -hmm. Then you get this old growth pine that's been aged for 50 years and that cabinet, that speaker is just alive. Mm -hmm. And so that's why a lot of the vintage amplifiers, speakers going back from the 50s, from the early days, are so coveted because they were made of this pine that is so aged that it just sparkles. Hmm. Wow. Yeah, I know a tube amp sounds nice and warm. And yeah, it, it it just has more variation. It, a solid state amp, it does one thing. Mm -hmm. It may do it well, but that's all it does. Right, it's flat. Tube amp, the way you play will change the way it sounds. Hmm. So just from the way you hold your pick can change the sound. Oh my. Very responsive. Now, in addition to guitars, both solid body electric guitars and acoustic guitars, uh, since I tend to be building on commission, somebody will ask me to build them a specific instrument. Sometimes they ask me to build something that I've never built before. Mm -hmm. And this was the case where a friend asked me to build her a mandolin. Now, a mandolin is sort of the next level up from an acoustic guitar because you're not just joining thin, flat pieces together. You're carving the top into an arch, both on the outer and the inside. Right, so you don't bend that. You no. actually make it round. That, that you carve it scrape scrap by scrap shaving by shaving until you get just the right shape because that's not by sanding that's more with a, no. a plane it is done with a plane and scraper mm -hmm. like gouges or something some gouges for the rough work so here you can see after i finish the mandolin the next year somebody else asked me for a mandola which is the next size up so this is the mandola soundboard 
where you can see I've roughed out some of the wood, got rid of it with a router, but then I use that little brass plane there to take shaving by shaving until I get the just the right contour. Oh, that's the thing on the lower left. That's the thing on the lower that, left. So okay. that, that's an instrument maker's plane. Hmm. Oh. Uh, so they, originally they were used for violin making, but of course they, when they started carving mandolins and mandolas back in the turn of the century, uh, that was adapted to it. So how long would you have in carving one a piece lot. of that? <laughs> it takes a long a time because on. first there's just smoothing out, in this case, the terraces from the router. Mm -hmm. But then you have to get just the right shape, and then you have to carve the inside as well so that you get just the right thickness, and it's not the same thickness all the way through. It's the thickness meant varies. Not to be as thick on different places? Yes, because... Oh. This, the top, is the soundboard, so it needs to vibrate a certain way. And so it has to be a little bit thicker at the top. As it goes down to the edges, it gets thinner and thinner and thinner. That's your speaker cone. Wow. Okay. Didn't and realize. I figured it was the same all the way through. No. That would be too easy. Yeah. <laughs> How did you learn this? I learned it from books. After all, I'm, a, I'm an academic, so I can learn stuff from books. Mm -hmm. yeah. And nowadays, of course, you have YouTube and all of that. Uh -huh. So, And part of it is just doing it. Mm -hmm. Right. So Trial is the error. front and the back or the same thickness or is the back the same? The back or? is pretty much the same way. Right. It's the not, same way? Thinner th on the edges? Yep, thinner on the edges. Huh. And so here you can see the inside. After you finish all the carving and getting that smoothed out, then you have to fit the braces to match what you've just carved. Mm. So that it... Oh, right. So that it's a solid glue joint. Right, that's that X part there. Yep. And, and then you course, take two pieces of wood around the outside? There are two pieces on the outside that are joined with the, uh, that kerfing. That's the grooved wood that hmm. will wrap it around and, and gives just a little bit more glue area to right. attach the top and the back to the sides. Okay. And, of course, carving the neck is another... I like carving the neck. It's a fun thing because it's very immediate mm. because you can feel as you're going along that it, okay that feels good that feels good no it needs a little bit over here oh. one so of the you things, don't use a pattern you just kind of do it by feel mostly by feel cool i mean oh. one of the things about carving the top and the, and the back is that you don't know how good a job you've done until the instrument is completely finished and you've got the strings on and you strum yeah. it for the first Too time <laughs> <laughs> so you don't know if you've done a good job until you've finished hmm. whereas wow. least, least with the neck you get an instant feedback oh, right. by how it feels. Oh. Now, would you do like a child's instrument, woman or man that would be different sizes? People have requested different sizes. I built a, an acoustic guitar for a gentleman who had very big hands. Mm -hmm. So he requested a wider, thicker neck than I could ever play. In fact, when I was trying to just test it as I was finishing it up, it was very hurt, hurting my hands to play it because oh it was just too big. For him, it just felt finally comfortable Right. because yes. he he's always been dealing with very thin necks, mm -hmm. which are normal size to us humans. Right. right. <laughs> <laughs> this was a Sasquatch or something. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> big guy. Mm -hmm. So what kind of, is there a different wood to use on a neck? They're usually maple or mahogany are traditional. And for a mandolin and mandola family, then it's all maple. Okay. With this has a walnut stripe in the middle, walnut insert in the middle, so it's a sandwich, hmm. which provides a little bit more stability, I feel. Right. That way, if one piece wants to return that way, it's counteracted by the piece on the other side. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so here's the finished instrument. Now, I normally don't do stains. I like to bask in the natural glow of the natural wood, but he wanted the stain, that dark amber, and so on the spruce, it's okay. But when you look at the backside, you can really see one of the reasons why people like stains on guitars is with that curly maple on the back. And it there brings out that figure in the maple back and sides. Now, what do you finish it with? Is it like rubbed oil or is it a varnish? I, fin or? I finish it with an oil varnish. There's lots of ways to finish. There's nitrocellulose oh. lacquer, which is the traditional finish from the 20th century. Hmm. But more and more people are moving away from that as far as the hand builders because it's very toxic. Hmm. Oh. And Ooh. so there are all sorts of rules, especially in California, on 
being just for the big companies being able to use that. They have oh. to have a lot of control areas, and so it's a li little bit more difficult to work with. Whereas with an oil varnish, I can do it in the guest bedroom. Right. Just like the, the car painters are going more towards uh, water-based. Right. Just because of the You don't need a respirator. That it off mm -hmm. Yeah, I've sprayed urethane before, and you need a really good... Uh, exactly. <laughs> you, you could die from that stuff. Oh, <laughs> God. I don't want to okay, do could that. you bring up your guitar and maybe talk about the different pieces and maybe what they should be made with or okay, design so features? Any acoustic guitar has a lot of different parts to it and each part demands a certain type of wood. So the soundboard needs to be a softwood. Uh, typically it's going to be a spruce, either Sitka spruce, Adirondack spruce, European spruce. Uh, so this is a Sitka spruce, also a bear claw sp Sitka spruce. So it has all these markings that are just inherent in the wood that looks like a bear had swiped it. Mm. Wow. And so those are less common. So the, it's a little bit stiffer of a top. Mm. Then, of course, ebony fingerboard, ebony bridge, very traditional. And that's wood or is that the... That's wood. Okay. That's all wood. And for here, I used a myrtle back and sides, which I love the figure of the myrtle and the color mm -hmm. of the myrtle. And uh, it's not the a traditional wood, but it's being used more and more as people are looking for more domestic wood choices rather than going to Brazilian rosewood, which you can't get anymore. Mm -hmm. And if you can get it because it's been stockpiled, it's a thousand dollars just for the back piece. Wow. Just for that one piece of wood and the side pieces. Oh. Now you're talking to the guy in the black market. And yeah. then <laughs> and then you can't import it outside Coming of the U.S. Up. because of CITES, because right. of their regulations. Mm -hmm. This is so, it, if you could just see it in person, it's it's glowing. Yeah. And the good one of the reasons why I like an uncolored wood, an unstained wood, is that as you move it, you yes. can see a chatoyance that it it changes its color depending upon the angle that you're looking at it. Mm -hmm. It it looks like a, um, one of those. It's sort of like pearly, if mm -hmm. you want to say it like that. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Depending on how you hold the shell, it. it a hologram. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm thinking. Okay. Hologram. It is three dimensional. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, and so I have a curly maple neck with little walnut and other woods in the middle just for sandwiching effect and either maple or mahogany or traditional neck woods because they're very stiff very stable right because over the time the, the pressure of the strings pulling on it exactly basically guitars are built at the point where they want to implode they want to collapse on themselves so we have truss rods in it I have carbon fiber strips mm -hmm. to pr help prevent that because as it net goes like that, the strings are going to go higher and higher and higher until the instrument's unplayable. Right. Mm -hmm. And I see you've got a, a, a logo at the top. I have my logo at the top of the instrument that was designed by one of Ryo's graphic design students many years ago. Uh, Benji Davis, the professor, the art professor, assigned it to his class on designing me a logo for Acorn House Workshop. Okay. Is that supposed to be just an acorn? Or that, is that, just, that is just an acorn. Okay. And this was the best design that I selected from what they submitted, gave the winner some cash for it, and that's been my logo ever since. Mm -hmm. That's very Looks nice. classy. Mm -hmm. Very. So, oh, other than making something that looks cool, uh, I guess it's supposed to work. Yeah, as I said, you don't know if it sounds good until you're finished. Okay. So Whether all the work is done works. to naught or not. So I yeah. uh, thought I'd sing you a little song, Pete Townsend song, okay. called After the Fire. After the fire, the fire still burns. The heart grows older, but never ever learns. The memory smolder, and the soul always yearns. After the fire, the fire still burns. I heard a voice asking, 
what happens after the fire and then the sound of a breaking window and the scream of a tire and the sound of a distant gun and the cry of a hungry child the night is hot and nothing's gonna stop this gang running wild after the fire the fire still burns the heart grows older but never ever learns the memory smolder the soul always yearns after the fire the fire still burns. I saw my villain in black and white. There ain't no color in my memories. He rolled his brother's old holly across the TV while I was laughing at Dom Deloise. Now I'm cycling through all my videotapes And I'm crying and I'm choking Look, gotta stop thinking I gotta stop drinking I gotta stop smoking Cause after the fire The fire still burns The heart grows older But never ever learns The memory is smaller The soul always yearns After the fire the fire still burns, raging through the pain, blackening the promises, the tears and the pain. The fire still burns, till the wind begins to turn, and it all begins again. After the fire, the fire still burns. After the fire, the fire still burns The heart grows older, but never ever learns The memory is smaller, the soul always yearns After the fire, the fire still burns I think it works pretty well. It was beautiful. All right, so I think we have about a minute left, and so uh, let's try out your uh, you, not ukulele. 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 Ook. This is an ook. So this is made of Hawaiian koa, which is a traditional ukulele wood since it came from Hawaii. Is that soft? Or? It is a hardwood. Okay. And so this is a George Harrison song. George Harrison was a pro great proponent of the ukulele, had mm -hmm. dozens of them in his car trunk, would give them to whoever he met with. Wow. <laughs> Everyone has choice. When to and not to raise their voices It's you that decide Which way you will turn While feeling that our love's not your concern It's you that decide No one around you